Peace, everybody. This is Akil Bay. Welcome to international law class number one. This will be one of many classes where we'll be honing in on strictly international law as it relates to Moors. Okay. So as you can see right here, um, the contact information, um, this class will be every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern time uh, as Telegram. Okay. This will be hosted on Telegram. All right. So if you uh, would like the link, you can um, get in touch with me uh, either by way of comment on YouTube or uh, the contact information shown on the screen. Okay, so let's get straight into it. So, why international law? Okay, for one, we know that international law is the pinnacle system of law used throughout the world. So let's, but what, what is international law, right? Shown on the screen, international law is an independent system of law existing outside the legal orders of particular states. So international law is an independent system, okay, of law. It's not the United States codes, regulations, ordinances, etc. It's not uh, any other government, France, uh, you know, Spain. It's not any other government, right? It's strictly a law, a system of law existing outside the legal orders of particular states. Why particular? Particular states meaning that only certain states or i.e. governments. States is another term for governments, which we'll get, in here, get into shortly. The United Nations is a group of independent states or independent governments. And not every government is a part of the United Nations. So particular states. So international law is a separate, is an independent system of law existing outside the legal orders of particular states. Right. So we know that this is this is a system of its own. Well, what kind of system? It's a system of treaties and agreements between nations that governs how nations interact with other nations, etc. So not only is it an independent system existing outside of anybody else's government, particular government. It's a system of treaties and agreements. So this is all about treaties specifically. Again, not United States codes, not their way. We will not find out how to uh, start a government. We will not find any type of answer that we need in their, in their government, in their system, right? That we know is not for us, right? Now, what do I mean by there? We know that the Treaty of Peace and Friendship was between who? The Moors and the United States of America. So the Moroccans and the Americans, the two different governments. Those are two different governments. The Moroccans and the Americans were two parties, two separate governments, right? So we're either Moor or American, right? Okay. So let's see. International law is typically a part of U.S. law only for the application of its principles on questions of international law rights and duties. So it's typically a part of United States law, right? International law, however, does not restrict the United States or any other nation making laws governing its own territory. So you, you got to, um, in uh, before we get into the next slide or the next few slides, it's important to know that nation and state are two separate terms, right? Hence the word nation-state, nation-state. 
So these are two separate terms used to combine or bring in a different reality. So the word nation was not sufficient enough itself in law to use as a term of government. It can mean a group of people and amongst other details, but it wasn't effective or sufficient enough to be able to use itself in reference to a government. So hence the word nation dash state, because state means government. Okay. So here we see again international law is typically a part of US law, right? But every government has the ability to make laws of their own. So we shouldn't be enforcing anybody's constitution, but your more state constitution this your this a part of your government that has made your government your state. Okay. So what is state? This is from Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. You may have heard many more say, my state is state of mind. My state is Allah. My state is um, Muslim or, you know, etc. That of a spiritual answer, right? Or a divine answer, right? Because spiritual means divine, as in the divine and national side or the higher side and the lower side, right? Or the spiritual side and the lawful side. Higher self, lower self. All this one, right? So state. What is state? According to the Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, a state is a people permanently occupying a fixed territory bound together by common law habits and custom into one body politic exercising through the medium of an organized government Independent sovereignty and control over all persons. Let me pause right there. State is a people controlling all persons. It's a people control controlling all persons. Persons are corporations, right? So a people controlling corporations. What is this? It's a government controlling organizations, persons, right? So state is the type of body politic. What kind of body, a body politic? You, you have theocratic body politics, you have or theocratic governments, etc. Well, how do we know that a state government is the exact type of body politic that's needed in order to exercise full powers in international law? Because no other government can do this. Right. Even though those types of governments and avenues are needed and are to work hand in hand. So a state gov a state is a people permanently occupying a fixed territory, i.e. your location, the longitude, latitude, right? Bound together by common law habits, customs, and custom into one body politic. Exercising through a medium of an organized government, meaning your three branches of government, your judicial, executive, and legislative, right? Those are your three branches of government that you should be exercising through. That has independent sovereignty and control over all persons and things within its boundaries capable of making war and peace and entering into relations entering into international relations with other communities of the globe so if your government whatever government you claim to have cannot do this then it is not the state that you have claimed to be because we got that when we going to get into that more specifically state is not just state of mind right your state is your government. So when you say your state of mind is X, Y, Z, that should be the name of your government as well as your state of mind because they should be one and the same. Okay. Here we see we have a grounded answer when we say state, when we see the word state. It's not, it's not your state of mind. 
just uh that's fifty percent of the answer. Okay. State is not only your state of mind, but your actual government. Okay. So this is from the Monte Vidalio Convention, Rights and Duties of a State. This is an actual international law document that um, we can we can use, we can see as a reference. So in Article 1, it explains what state is. Okay. The state is a person of international, and it says the state as a person because of how it previously worded it or prepared this uh, article. But the state as a person of international law should possess the following qualifications. So it's four qualifications or four elements, right? So we, we, we're talking about the spirit too as well. So it's four elements or four qualifications. A permanent population, i.e. a nation, Right. So we no longer have to use the word nation state. State. Is nation in itself, that's one fourth. Of what. Makes the word state is your permanent population, i.e. your nation. OK. A defined territory, i.e. your longitude latitude of the so-called state you live in now, which is actually a province or a corporation. A government, so you have your three branches of government, right? Capacity into inter, capacity to enter into relations with other states. So your government with these three branches should be able to exercise full powers of international law with other governments amongst the world, across the world. So if your government cannot do that, again, there must be more boxes that you have to check, as J. Jermaine Bay would put it, right? That you need in order to express full powers. Okay. So, it, this is all about, um, you know, knowing as, as Moors throughout time that there were groups of Moors throughout the, the decades that had so many solutions, Right? They built up to this time, this pinnacle. Now we've built up to, we can go to the pinnacle, international law, right? It has now been established for us enough to use. Okay. So the type of body politic is a state government. Okay. Not a um, theocratic government, which a theocratic government, i.e. the Moore Science Temple of America, which is a religious organization, right? Should be within a Moorish state government. Opposed to being in the United States Corporation or United States of America. Right. Even though those are two different things, but. It should not be under those uh those uh, umbrellas it should not be a part of that side of the party it should be in its own government under its own government this is where the corporations are supposed to work hand in hand this is how the more science temple of america gets clean because we no longer have people that can block away in their own government that they're a part of now right this now laws that can be enacted opposed to waiting for a certain person to use their character to clean up shop when there's laws as well as your character that can be used okay so we see this state again is not only a state of mind but it's an actual government Okay, we're talking three branches of government. We're talking about a state constitution. We're talking about an inauguration, etc. Okay. Just like every other European government throughout the world. Would it know what Dry Lee said? He was going to leave the Europeans here long enough for us to learn government. We can't learn government in the United States Corporation 
because they'll never even give us the first step to how to start it, right? The only thing you can do with United States codes, regulations, etc., is play defense. You'll never play offense. The best thing you can do is find out how to do a lawsuit or uh, or uh, maybe even get land and not pay bills. Or so you'll get so many small victories, so many small victories. But doing business as an organization within somebody else's government was a learning process. You know, we can it taught us trust law, right? It taught us wills and stuff like that. We it taught us some useful things. But as a whole, in its highest integrity, to obtain our independence and sovereignty, we have to approach it from the highest aspect first and only, dealing with the treaties. Okay, so this is from um, the book Vienna Convention, Law on Treaties, and it's a commentary. Okay, so it's a commentary on the Vienna Convention, Law on Treaties, which is the treaty that governs all treaties in international law. Okay, the VCLT. In this book. It explains um, a few definitions. It says treaty means an international agreement concluded between states written and it kind of it cut me off. So I can't um, finish the sentence. But basically, a treaty is an international agreement concluded between states. Meaning governments, states mean governments, right? As we've seen in the previous screen on the previous screen slide. So you see how it's capitalized, capitalized meaning that when you're talking about that, it's just like naming um, the play, a place of somewhere. It has to be cap or naming somebody's name. It has to be capitalized. So when that S is capitalized, we're talking about an actual government, a state government, a state. Right. You don't have to say nation state. You really don't have to say state government. It's a state. State is government. Government is a part of the state, right? As well as the nation. So ratification, right? It says ratification is acceptance, approval, and accession. These are all synonyms. But what are you ratifying? What what is it that you're acceding to? What is it that what is being accepted? It's your constitution that needs to be ratified. Right. As we continue the sentence, uh, what's on the screen that we can read, we can see that to be bound to a treaty, basically, something needs to be ratified. What is that something? Your state constitution. OK. Your state constitution is to be ratified. Right. Sent in. So people can acknowledge you. Okay, so people can be put on notice. You're not trying to be recognized by nobody. And we're talking about law, lawful terminology. You're not trying to be recognized by anybody. You're letting people know that you exist, just like many Moors tried to do to the United States. But the United States doesn't have that power to acknowledge another government and et cetera, et cetera, when they're doing dirty work themselves, such as operating as a corporation, pretending to be a government when they can only have nine tenths possessions, right? Unlike every other government that can claim land where they are, et cetera, et cetera, rightfully. So full powers means a document emanating from the competent authority of a state. So full powers is a international um, lawful term that means competent. So you may have heard more say, are you competent? Or somebody's incompetent, right? In international law, if you cannot express full powers, it means you are not competent. This is why some of, uh, well, most of the documents that get sent in, practically all of them, 
get sent in never get acknowledged from individual moors because it's not coming from a state government. Many moors already know that if it's not a corporation, none at least, they're not responding. They can only respond to corporations. Okay, well, what type of body politic? What type of corporation? Is it a corporation at all? Well, if they're a government, they should be responding to other governments, not a government responding to a corporation within that government claiming a certain title. Okay. So doing business as is, it, 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 had its, it had its run. It taught us a lot, right? It became very useful. It taught us that, thing, that things can be um, done, right? But we cannot claim the land as an organization within somebody else's government and call it there and wait for things to fall right into the hands of your organization. We can't do that. We just have to go to the pinnacle. Okay. So full powers instead of saying, okay, my fault. I had a call come in. Um, so that's why it's a hiccup in the video that I had to edit. So, but as I was stating, the state is an ancient thing and has many esoteric principles or perspectives, uh, principles and perspectives to it. So um, the state basically um, is, is the government, again, that you're a part of on the, the, lower, the lower plane, right? The 3D is the government, it's the actual government. That you're a part of, that you pay taxes to. Why? Because they defend you. They do a lot of things for you, provide a lot of things for you, are here to make your life easier, right? So, um, not only is the state the physical, but it's again the spiritual, the mental part. So, we have the Constitution, right? That governs how you're to be treated. Okay. So we have third state. What is the third state? Coming from the same book. Vienna Convention Law and Treaties. A commentary. Third state. Means a state. Other than the predecessor state. Or the successor state. So the third state. Is a state. Other than the two states that were in that treaty, basically. So we had the treaty of peace and friendship between two states, right? Two governments. A third state is a government or a third, a third government, third party, third state party that can use the treaty itself as the treaty has given a sovereignty to uh, the group of people creating that state government. So your state is what confers sovereignty, nationality, etc. You know, it's first sovereignty is in the mind. So it's, it's on a soulful, spiritual level, that's, that's half the story. But on, on, on the earthly plane, on the black and white, right? A state or this third state party Okay, because the Treaty of Peace and Friendship is a binary or a bilateral, excuse me, treaty. So the third state will have access and full powers to that treaty in international law. So what is uh, the United Nations? What is the Vienna Convention on Succession of States in respect to treaties? As it states on the screen. What is the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? Right? The treaty that governs all treaties in modern law. It's a decolonization process. So that's perfect for us Moors, right? To get rid of, get rid of the colonizers. Who are exercising extraterritorial jurisdiction on this land. Okay? Extraterritorial jurisdiction. Okay, so the United Nations 
is the group to approach. Why? Because that's the group that governs modern day international law itself. Okay. So from the book Principles of uh, Political Science. It goes in on more so the metaphysics of state. As we've kind of been um, going over in this video. State is used to denote the sovereign unity of a number of people settled in a fixed territory and organized under one government. Government is the practical manifestation or organization of the state and the central to it. In ordinary language, state and government are often used interchangeably, but the but for political science, the definite distinction is necessary. Government is the machinery through which the ends or purposes of the state are realized. The state is largely an abstraction. Government is concrete. Okay, so let's start from from the start the top of what's highlighted. The state is the sovereign number of people. So no person can be sovereign um, in totality. In the spiritual side, yes. But when you're talking about both planes, you're talking about by law, because you are the law. This should be expressing not how not only your sovereign and spirit, right? This is we're talking about God given rights that no pen, the, the right to breathe, etc. We're talking about God given rights uh, that should be able to match man's law. So universal law and man's law should be able to match as one. Who's here to reintroduce that? The Moors. But first, we have to learn how to start a state government in order to call out everybody else's um, situations to clean up house. OK, because that's what we're doing. We're bringing does your peace not not no fake fluffy fake love if you will okay so state is used to denote a sovereign unity right a sovereign number of people on a fixed territory okay organized under one government and the government is the the lower self of the state okay so that's what Moore's got caught up saying, my state is state of mind. When we have to exercise our fluidity, we have to we have to be able to uh, look at this from an international lens only, or first and foremost. Okay. The government is the practical manifestation or organization of the state. OK. They're the same word, as it says, meant to is used interchangeably. Right. Government is the machinery. Through which the ends or purpose of the state is realized. So if you want people to realize your state of mind, your your the peace that you say or claim that you have should be exercised through your three branches of government, man's law and universal law as one. Right. We're not talking about which religion, etc., even though religion is a part of it. That's a big part of it. That's why more say, you know, my some more say my stand in line is you know, Allah, Muslim or etc. Um, because. They're talking about the spiritual side, the, the spiritual side of how they realign, realign their mind. Religion is realignment. Right. So the divine side, the religious side, the spiritual side, that's the state, as well as the national side. The word state consolidates the word divine and national. That's what Noble Dwali was getting at. It's, it's, but we're going we gonna to get more into how this is so, because we see that state is not only a spiritual or divine thing, but state actually means the government, which makes you the national the Moorish national. Okay. So the state is largely an abstraction or that of the mind, a spiritual thing, 
right? Even though the body is spiritual too. Government is concrete or the lower self. The word state is used where strictly speaking government should be used. So we just, this is just redundancy we're going over here. One of the essential characteristics of a state is sovereignty, a characteristic lacking in each of these so-called states. Now, why does it say so-called? Because it's referring to the United States. They're lacking sovereignty. The characteristic of sovereignty is lacking in the United States. What they have is nine-tenths possession. They'll never have complete possession or full powers de jure in international law because that means that they already broke international law, right? Due to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship and amongst really several other treaties that they've already broken. It's, we, we have to get back to the origin, but to get back to the origin, we have to set ourselves up first. We have to worry about ourselves first, Okay. So the only way we can exercise sovereignty, right? Sovereignty is not an individual thing in international law. Okay. The, you know, and this this for my people who uh, listen to Seven Bomar and others. That they're totally correct when they say sovereignty is, you know, in you and all that. But we have to realize the other arenas, the metaphysics of law. This is what, again, Seven Bomar was speaking on. When um, he uh, mentioned the 164th missing piece, which is the law. We can freely talk about everything else so easily, no problem. But law is really what they don't worry want you to talk about. For a reason, that's that 164th piece that was missing, right, in the story of Thoth. So, again, we have these so-called states exercising their, their quote-unquote sovereignty. Again, in Principles of Political Science, it says, The nation underlies the state. And again, he characterizes that the state as a nation organized in a certain way. They are two separate terms, and I'm only reading the highlighted points. So nation and state are two separate terms. So when more say, you know, nationality, claim nationality, that's, that's the way, that's the order of the day, right? That's half the story. Because when we break down nation as it relates to national, as it relates to nation, right? Nationality, national, and nation are not the word state. Okay. Nationality is 50%. Right, of the story. So nationality is not government itself. Nationality is one which we're gonna get into more into that in some screens to come. Nationality relates to traditions, customs, language, common origin of birth, etc., all which influence a state heavily, but it's not the actual state itself. When you want to create a government, you don't say nothing about nationality. You say state. And that's the type of body politic. Why? Because your nation or your nationality, the group of people, the common origin, common history, etc. Your nation is one fourth of what state is. That's one of the four elements or one of the four qualifications. So instead of saying nationality, we should be saying statehood is the order of the day. Our government is the order of the day. Right. So it says nation has definitely become political in meaning the other nationality, while it also has certain political content, lays emphasis on the root meaning of common birth and other common elements such as language, traditions, etc., usually accompanying common birth. Nationality is a spiritual sentiment or principle arising among a number of people, usually of the same race resident uh, I didn't mean to put this on here I remember that I don't think 
But so we see that there's a difference between nationality and state because there's a difference between nation and state itself. Two separate terms. So statehood is the order of the day. Statehood is what's going to is it's the it's the key. We don't want to be stateless or without a government. We can have a nationality or a nation pe- people all day that have common traditions, histories, etc. We can teach history all day without having a government. So proclaiming nationality is not exactly uh, the whole story. That's 50 percent. That's a lot. It's really, it's more than 50 percent in all honesty. But it's not the exact uh, combination we need. OK, it's not politically correct. It's not. Let's just be exact. It's not politically correct. Um, what is this? I I don't remember putting this on here. So derived agreement making capacity is conferred upon a single non-state entity by possessing the capacity themselves. Okay, so basically it's talking about the state you recognize yourself. Okay. Possessing the capacity themselves. You recognize yourself. You don't need anybody's permission. You don't need anybody's recognition. You don't need anybody's uh, any of that. You're just putting your putting everybody on notice saying, hey, if you want to do business, you can do business with us on this land from now on. And that's what it is. Here's our constitution, etc. Okay. Now, international law, keep in mind, is is a uh is is only international law because of our own Moroccan laws. They only exist because of our Moroccan laws exist. And by that I mean in international law, they can't they have to accede or they have to uh promise to enforce your treaties that you claim to be a part of or would like to enforce enforce. They have to uh uh, wholeheartedly enforce that in order for them to be the international organization that they are today. So what is the international, the United Nations itself? Because I don't think we covered this point. The United Nations is a group of independent, let's see. Hey, what did I do with that picture? So, anyways, um, what type of uh, authority does the United Nations have? Let's let's cover that because that's the picture that I'm looking for before we finish this page. The United Nations is able to acknowledge the credentials of any government or so it can acknowledge the credentials of any government. And they can be a non-member, what's called a non-member state, or they can be a member state, which is not only can they recognize or not only can they acknowledge you, but they will recognize you and um, you'll be a part of their um, the United Nations. So in the United Nations, they can recognize you or acknowledge you, your credentials, right? Either way, you're able to express full powers. Now, what is the United Nations? The United Nations is an international organization made up by a number, I believe it's 192, state governments or states. So it's not just an organization. It's an organization made up of several states, made by several states. So these several states now lean on this international law because if they if they don't follow the international law as they promise to, now it's consequences they have to pay for disrupting the peace that they promise to keep or uplift the charters, etc. So that's being a 
member or non-member, regardless, you have to um, enforce international law. Now, being a non-member does differ from being a member, obviously. But when you're a non-member, where you're exercising complete sovereignty and complete independence. No selling yourself back into slavery. There's no none of that. There's no saying the United Nations is a government. It's not a government. It's an international organization made by many governments. So it can't be a democracy or a Republican type of government. It's not a government. It's an organization. This is how empires are started. Right. So let's get back to the screen. Um, and I'm trying to remember what this point, the point of this screen was, but it says the established method to assign agreement making capacity to a non state entity is to agree on it by way of international treaty. OK. So in order for a non state entity to establish itself and make agreement making capacity in an agreement making capacity, i.e. if it wants to you know, make agreements with other nations or other states, nation states. It must do so by way of uh, international treaty. Right. So within the limits of their implied powers, non-state entities, i.e. international organizations. OK, non-state entities. And, or i.e. international organizations. So. Or people who are doing business as an organization is not a state entity. It's not a state government. May agree to passing their derived agreement making capacity to a newly established international legal entity. So. Some some people, for whatever reason, may be in a predicament to where they don't have a, a certain treaty or treaties that backs them right in order to uh, have a treaty or to be amongst the affairs of men in international law they can um, talk to the United Nations and possibly establish a treaty in which they'll be able to be uh, able to express full powers in international law with okay so, um, this page was uh, not really that important. I'm not sure why I chose to put it on here. But this is from the Act of Algeciras, 1906. Okay. This is a Moroccan treaty. This is Moroccan law. The Act of Algeciras, 1906. Okay, so this is coming from a Moroccan government, a Moroccan legislation, meaning it's Moroccan law. Okay. It says in Article 121, this general act will be ratified according to the constitutional laws particular to each state. So each state is supposed to have a constitution and able to enforce this general act. Right. It says the qualifications will be deposited in Madrid earliest that to make could be and at least 31 December 1906. It will be drawn up deposit. It will be drawn up deposit in official report who certified copies confirms will be given to the power signatories by the diplomatic way. So it was deposited at Madrid. Which. Uh were like the United Nations today, things that were are to be deposited or were to be deposited at that time. Okay. So we see who governed um, or, or w w what type of governance or who was governing international law, the Moors. Right. This is coming from our own Moroccan law saying that we need a constitution for each state in order to enforce this particular Moroccan law. So, again, this is not 
modern international law coming up with new laws to try to put us in a trick bag, right? Our own law saying that we need a constitution. Each state, capital S, right? Needs a constitution. Right, and it needs to be ratified and deposited in Madrid. This is from the UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration of Rights on Indigenous People, saying that states provide uh, redress through effective mechanisms, which may include restitution. So we're talking about reclamation, right? In order to reclaim, you have to be a state, right? So the state can provide uh, effective mechanisms, which may include restitution, developed in conjunction with indigenous people with respect to their cultural, intellectual, religious, or sp and spiritual property, taken without their free, prior, and informed consent, or in violations to their laws, traditions, and customs. Okay, so states is what produce or push or provide restitution for indigenous people. For what it says, cultural, intellectual, religious, what it's talking about, nationality, right? We've got the same um, religions, same uh, perspectives, same political interests and views and aims, right? So here... In, again, the book Principles of Political Science, it says, oh, we already went over this. Um, well, let's see what it says. I'm not sure if it says anything different. Government is the organization of the state, the machinery through which the state will be expressed. A people set it on a def def definite, excuse me, territory cannot constitute a state till a political organization has been formed. Okay, so... Again, you cannot claim your territory and claim yourself as any type of government until a political organization has been formed and acknowledged, obviously. So there's no doing business with organizations then throwing a, you know, Moorish national uh, Republican federal government, something like that. You know, you're not going to just come out of nowhere and just put the United States on notice strictly and never deal with United Nations. When the United States cannot acknowledge anybody's credentials as a new government, they cannot do that. They're a corporation themselves pretending to be a government. They can't acknowledge anybody else's as a new government. Right. So, um, the organization may be very kind in complex in, in complexity. Government is the organization which shows that the essential relation of command and obedience has been established. Government exists wherever that wherever that is confirmed, whether it is in a vast organization like that one of the United States, or in the simple tribal tribal government of the Australian Aborigines. The government is the organization. I lost myself. Organization of the state. The organ of unity. The organ whereby the common purposes which underline the, that unity are definitely translated into pr practical reality. It is the focus of the, com the common purpose of the people. Uh, it goes to say down to number four. The fourth characteristic of the state is sovereignty. Okay. This is the supreme element of statehood. So sovereignty is a supreme element. Yeah, we went over that several times. Um, we went over this. Okay, okay. Had another call come in. My wife ain't playing no games tonight. So let's get back to it, right? Um, let's just start off with the bottom um, paragraph here. It says, our distinction of state, nation, and nationality may now be clear, be made clear by saying that the state, the nation is the state plus nationality. Okay. 
So this is <laughs> it says the nation is the state plus nationality. But you have to use the term nation state in order to uh, have a stronger influence of the government itself. So when we look up the actual international law documents, it says what the state is the nation. Right. So this book, we, we can we can weigh out when, um, you know, uh, the, the weight of certain words. The history of words throughout time has changed. At one time, it was about um, a nation and nationality, strictly more so. Until properties that of a state became uh, utilized. So there was no point of using the term nationality. Now it's all about state. Okay, this this word has the most influence, the strongest value, the highest value, right? The highest dominion in international law. So as a general rule, the parties must intend. This is talking about Moors who are doing business as an organization, i.e. Moors Science Temple of America or any other organization. This is talking about what must be done if they want it to be recognized as a state government. So it says, as a general rule, the parties must intend to create a legally binding instrument comp comprising rights and obligations in order to conclude a treaty in terms of the VCLT, which is the Vienna Convention Law on Treaties, the treaty that governs all treaties. So an uh, organization as a general rule, must create a legally binding instrument. What is that? A constitution. What kind of constitution? A state constitution. Compromising rights and obligations in order to conclude a treaty. Right? So if you want all the nations to recognize you, or if you want them to, you know, do business with you, etc., and acknowledge you, you have to create a legally binding instrument. Okay? Now, another uh, concept that's out there is floating is that the letters of rogatory could be used as a way to create a state government, which is not correct, but we'll go into that another time. Okay? That's nowhere in our Moroccan laws. Does it say letter of rogatory should be used for our salvation, our liberation? That's not the key to create a state. There's only one way to create a state government. It's simple. They made it simple. There's not a plethora of ways, as I once thought before. There's only one way. According to our own Moroccan laws and modern law, international law. So, and to say things like, a, you know, a letter of rogatory is needed and you got to go through the uh, United States government to send to another foreign court when another government has to be established in order to get a reply from that court, foreign court. We, we about to get into that another time. So... Here we see that an organization must create a legally binding instrument, right? If the intent of the parties to be legally bound under international law cannot be determined on the basis of the objective criteria, it has to be assumed that no legal relations have been established. So if you cannot prove that you have um, that your objective criteria, i.e., your emanating document, i.e., whatever you're using, whether it's a nationality card, so called, whether it's some type of document, if whatever you're using cannot be proved that you are legally bound in international law, then, and if it doesn't, if you haven't checked the boxes, right, if you haven't went through the instructions, 
then you it has been yet you have failed to establish yourself as a, a, a state government. You'll remain a organization under somebody else's government. Okay. So international organizations, i.e. body politics or local governments, right, even, but specifically international organizations are not entitled to sign or express consent to be bound by a treaty without having produced full powers, according to Article 2, or excuse me, Article 7, Paragraph 2. Okay, so organizations or Moors doing business as an organization are not entitled to express any treaties. So if Moors say they have been expressing the Treaty of Peace and Friendship or any other Moroccan treaty, when they're doing business as an organization, they're lying. Now, what they possibly could have done is put the treaty in their documentation and claimed that that was the reason that, you know, they got a small victory, right? The lawsuit or pay bills or whatever, when actuality it wasn't the treaty that got them off the hook. It was how they set themselves up in the articles of the organization or their organization in order to uh, cross certain T's and dot certain I's, in order to gain small victories. Okay, but this these are the victories that tend to blind many of us Moors and get comfortable into thinking that, yeah, we're being um, economically productive. We're doing business, right? We're active, right? But active is not the same thing as competent in, in, in international law. We must match our activity or us being active with being active in international law, in the international arena, okay? No longer as an organization under somebody else's government all from our government alone, in which we know we need. So, legislator. Obviously, this relates to the legislative branch. One of three branches in your government or in your state government that you should be aiming to create. A legislator, in etymological sense, is the maker of laws. It also means to carry or to bear children. So what type of people bear children in today's world? Women, right? Women are the maker of laws. What is the law? The length, angle, width. What is that? The baby. The physical body itself. So the legislative department, according to the etymology, should align with women. In that apartment. Okay. Because legislator means to make children. So even if we didn't have the three branches of government. The woman would be called a legislator. Right. There'll be that legislator branch. Of Allah or God. Or whatever you call it. So. Now we're talking about the matriarchal form of government. Because. Outside of phys outside of the written law, we have you know we can we we can't we 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 can say um you know women are the legislator of maker of laws, but that's half that's half the answer right we can continue to the the screen and say the legislator is bearing children, so the person in that legislative branch should be able to bear children if they're a legislator, according to etymology. Not just sign or make laws. Right? We should make man's law and universal law make be as B1. That's the problem today. Literally, when man came in this, 
in the legislative department and said, yeah, this is my position. Well, now we got we got tainted, tainted spheres, tainted activity, I'm not saying that, you know, it's unlawful to have a man in the legislative department. No, nah, you handle your more state government as you choose. I'm just bringing up etymology, you know, in simple facts. It means to bear children, right? So that person should be able to bear children as well as make laws. So legislation means bearing, right? It, you know, enacting of laws, right? Okay, so to be active, you got to enact first. It starts inside, enact. Then you empower, E-N, then E-M, or I-N, then I-M, right? So the legislative is the most, is the more important, indeed, the fundamental function of government. So the, it's the more important part of government. Why is that? Because without the legislative department, Without the legislative branch, who's going to make the laws? That means if there is no laws, if there's no legislative branch, then how is the judicial and the executive going to be the judge and the executive? The executives, right? So the legislative, i.e. the woman, i.e. the matriarchal part of government, or the feminine side, right? Births the masculine side. So zeros and ones. The zero birthed the one, right? Zero represents the feminine. One represents the man. Okay. So we're talking about balance in one government. Now, this is for... Um, the local bodies, again, the Moors doing business as an organization in or under the United States government. OK, so for all local bodies are subordinate to the central government. So your local body is subordinate to the central government. Even if you say you proclaim your nationality, right? It says their laws are really only bylaws, i.e. the Moors Science Temple of America. It's divine constitution and bylaws, right? So the constitution, what is the, what, or excuse me, the Moore Science Temple of America, what is the purpose, right? What is, what is the purpose of the Moore Science Temple of America if the goal is to go higher? Its purpose is to work hand in hand with the Moore state government. It's a local body that's supposed to help control or govern the local uh, you know, affairs such as, you know, utilities, you know, culture, schooling, etc. is to help keep that in order and to be in cooperation with the state government who is handling affairs with other nations across the world. So now we're talking about on a global scale and then we're talking about on the uh, community, on the local scale. OK, a state government controls the local government and the, you know, other organizations. So it says they have a, their constitution, which define their powers. They can make laws within limits and anything done beyond these limits is ultra virus virus or beyond their powers and therefore void. OK, so they can make a constitution i.e. the divine constitution, and have their laws, i.e. their bylaws. But they have limits. Okay? And if they go beyond these limits, what they do becomes void, or what they're saying becomes void. So we cannot use an organization to express full powers when an organization... More, more specifically, an international organization has limits, right? It's not 
the international standpoint itself. The international standpoint itself is what? The United Nations. That's who you approach. You don't you don't be an organization in somebody else's government trying to claim land when you, you, you can't express full powers. You're not a government itself. Just be a government if you want to do that, right? Just straight up say say you're a government. Just only use those strict words. I'm a state government. That's it. Stop playing around, right? All laws exact. We don't need to try to reinvent no wheels, try to find out different ways. Everything literally is laid out in our Moroccan laws that was came before Noble Drali, came before all of us, that said what we should do, right? Now, why didn't Noble Drali do this? Because we got to think about this. During the time he was alive, when he came on the scene, 1913, right? 1906 was the time the act of Alta Sirius was just came on the scene a few years before 1913, right? So, in which it said a constitution is needed. So, this is fresh in the people's minds. Many of what governs, much of what governs modern day international law just was just established in 1933, 1969, etc. So, this is why he said the half has not been told. This is why he said Moore's 50 years later will get it because it had to be a certain process for international law to, uh, it basically had to develop so much in order for us to establish ourselves fully where we need to be. Okay. So he brought everything for us, Noble Drali. He brought everything for us to begin the processes of understanding where we need to be. But we didn't have a, a state government. Some of us didn't have a state government. Well, I'm, I'm saying more clearly. At that time, nobody had a state government. But now some of us do have a state government. If you're in Georgia, uh, you know, um, previously Georgia is now AMPAG. That's abbreviation. Or uh, the Colorado Territory or Oregon. There's actually more state governments that have came online and have done the the steps they're going through the processes of uh being the state government there are they are all in different um, phases right but those are the only three states that have currently been um acknowledged as more state governments in international law currently okay so it says the point of difference is that whereas the provincial provincial governments of a federal state are guaranteed by the fundamental constitution unaltered by the ordinary processes of legisl legislation local bodies exist at the will of the central government so the provincial government their constitution their fundamental constitution is unaltered so this is not an organization creating a constitution for their organization you know in the United States no if it's not a state constitution if you're not an organization writing a state constitution sending it into the people they can actually recognize you or recognize or acknowledge you as a state government then you're not taking the proper aim nothing is to be done Strictly or, or more so on to the United States. We're not talking about sending paperwork to them. You know, we're, we're going to put them on notice too. Yeah, of course. Once we establish ourselves in the right manner, that's a part of the process. But many of us Moors are sending paperwork into the United States more so. When that's not the answer. Okay. So it says... Local government implies decentralization and de and de evolution of function, but the powers, functions, and constitution of local bodies are fixed by statute. Again, the constitution for a local body, if it's not a state constitution, 
is fixed by statutes. That's the furthest you can go. Statutes, right? Remember, local bodies are limited by what? Statutes. They're, that's the furthest they can go. Beyond that, it's beyond their powers. Okay? Making it void. Some writers, it is true, use the term local governments in the wider, wider sense of state government in a federation or a local administration by government officials. This is not correct. Okay, so local governments, though you're sending in your constitution, though you're having your bylaws, we must not get this confused. This is not the same thing as a state government. Okay. It's similar. Yes, the Moore Science Temple of America was set up to for people to get familiar with processes of government. So, you know, grand sheiks and assistant grand sheiks, etc. You know, there's different positions, but these positions are not uh, the exact positions needed for your three branches of government, etc. Now, I'm not saying you have to use the term president, but in your state constitution, everything should align as to who's the so-called president, governor, etc. OK, you can use your own terminology, but it has to you have to follow the steps in order for, to do that. OK, based on your own Moroccan laws, not nobody else's new way of doing things. These are because of your own ancestors. Right. You yourself, really. So local governments, though you have your constitution and bylaws, it's not the same as the state government in this state constitution in this laws scientifically speaking it says they are only states they are states only by courtesy and by they is talking about the united states right scientifically speaking they are states only by courtesy it would be no more correct to call them provinces provinces they are not they do not possess essential characteristics of a state, which is sovereignty. OK, so now again, we talk about nine tenths. Everybody thinks they're the sovereign, but they can never put that capstone on top. They can never truly be this. And this is what's going to be their downfall, that missing capstone, which they cannot utilize. So by courtesy, only by way of courtesy. Right. Are they considered states, meaning our own acquiescence, meaning we're being f nice or foolish enough to call them states and complain about how we can't exercise human rights. Right. That's by our own, quote unquote, courtesy. They do not possess. OK, let me I read that. It says it must also be remembered that the words federal state really mean federal government. Federal applies to government, not to state. A federal state is not a, com a compound state with divided or dual sovereignty. The state is one and sovereign, and the form of government is federal. So when you hear more say, I have you know, more national, federal, state, Republican government, or whatever, that that they're mixing up terminology. Okay. So we're we're winding down to the end of the slide here, the end of the presentation. And it says American. Right? This is coming from the eighteen twenty eight Webster's Dictionary. It says American. A native of America originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. Now, this word American. It says in this dictionary that it was applied to copper colored races, right, i.e. Moors. But 
Where in international law was this term applied? When was American, the term American, applied to Moors? When there was a treaty between Moors and Americans. That's two different governments. So when did Moors start calling themselves Americans? When did we say, hey, in law, in this treaty, remember international law is strictly treaties. So in this international law, where does it say? Moors have applied the term American to themselves. In this 1828 dictionary by this Englishman, not even a law dictionary. So we have many holes here. It says American is a native of America. So that's a kink in itself, right? The original native was us at first, and now it's you know, it gets messy being, you know, the five dollar more the five dollar Indians, right? So American was applied to the aboriginals. They knew not to say Moors. Because that'll give it all away. So how are you American of any sort? How are you American? What kind of American? A Moor American? How are you a Moorish American? When in international law, the exact term Moorish American cannot be found. If all law are ally exact, we should be able to find these exact words. Okay. Now, I'm going to build more so on that in another video um, way more extensively. But it should be duly noted that to combine two governments is not possible. When we say well, it is possible, we have not consolidated into one. We have not, you know, when more say African-American is a misnomer. Uh, and all these other, you know, misnomers. Well, if African and American is a misnomer, how is Moorish American any more rightfully, lawfully so? When there was no uh, clause, citizenship clause, in any treaty making Moors citizens of America. Okay. Now, what they do call Moors who are uh, deemed as citizens of America, citizens of the United States, what they do call them is Moor subjects and protégés because they have been subjugated and are protected by another government. So this means you must follow the laws of the government you're protected by. Okay. So American is not a Moor. There's no such thing as a Moorish American. Okay. What we can't understand is that this whole process was used as a stepping stone, as well as much infiltration being done on behalf of members, not every member, of course, but previous members throughout the decades in the temple, in the Moorish Science Temple of America. Okay. So we'll get into more so of that in another video. But let's just do this. Let's note. Moors and Americans, two separate parties. We are not Moorish American. Okay. What establishes a Moorish state government? Now, thanks to Ann Pag for showing everybody the way and being the deacon, the beacons of light that they are as a government. They have made it simple for us. All of these answers can be found in modern day international law, which is our own Moroccan law. One and the same. So this is a consolidation of steps that you might want to take a picture of in which you need, besides those four qualifications that we read earlier, to establish a state government. Okay. State constitution, a state seal, a state flag, the Moroccan flag, allegiance and oaths, public inauguration and state effects, i.e. your writs from the courts, your court, consular court. Okay. 
And for those who would like to uh, follow Ampag, this is uh, their YouTube information. Okay, you can um, study one law class at a time. If you scroll at the bottom and start there, you can start at law class one and uh, make your way up. Okay, um, so you have to type in all of this in YouTube. You can't just type in Ampag. You won't be able to find them. And this is Ampag's. Um, with a G at the end, not a C, like Ampag. This is Ampag, right? And you can type in Ampag Media to find them, okay? Good people to build with on both behalves. Um, there's also a new Mecca, but I'm not sure if they're on YouTube or not. But that's the third more state government that's online currently. Okay, so our duties are to reach out to people um, in our areas, you know, more who are ready to establish three seats of government, just like everybody else in the world in order to be a government, you know. Um, in future videos, we're going to go into um, more in depth between what's the difference between theocratic government, state government, um, other avenues, um, we're going to we're going to talk about the uh, how the Moore Science Temple could work um, hand in hand when they're dealing with a Moore state government, because um, that's truly the only way to clean house when you enact and enforce laws. And unfortunately, um, the people who are not on this, when it's time to, you know, for the Moore state government to enforce laws and people are still being belligerent, saying, hey, Whatever you're doing is not right, but obviously coming with some type of force, force or power. If you know, you know, a law is law, you know, and by you know, when the outlaw is recognized, you know, law must take course, it must be, you know, due course must be taken, justice must be taken, okay? Because what's going on is that a lot of us are claiming that we're sovereign in ourselves, and that's not true. Therefore, while being a citizen is under somebody else's government, the title sovereign citizen has been uh, claimed. It's just, it's just as real as Jesus, right? Jesus is only real because so-called black people made it real. And it now exists in the minds of black people. So now it's real. Sovereign citizen yeah, is not really a real thing, but the way people keep moving... It's going to be real to a certain degree. You see, you cannot be sovereign by yourself. In order to be sovereign, you need to have a state. And that not only means a state of mind, but a acknowledged government. Right. So we got to just check the boxes, y'all. You know, a lot of us just got to, you know, uh, rewire our, our mentalities. You know what I'm saying? Um. It's, it's a lot of reason as to why we're still saying the same and why, you know, we're changing. But it's up to you. It's literally the Moors that's stopping themselves from doing anything. It's a lot of Moors that believe they have the way, you know, and they're still doing business as an organization, you know, etc. Having a number of small victories. But this takes... Um, putting your ego to the side more so when you're doing it this way just like everybody else is starting a state government because now you have to not only depend on yourself you can move as yourself as a, a organization right but when you talk about a state government you, you have to depend on not only yourself but others that have take, taken oaths allegiances to a state government okay so this is not one group, you know, claiming all of North America, so-called, right? Trying to govern all those people. That's just not realistic. Nobody does that. <laughs> so we are to learn government by reading their instructions. Reading that they say it's only one system of law. That's international law. And then reading what they say when they say this 
system of law, international law, is all about treaties. So let's strictly study treaties, put these United States codes, all that stuff down. Right? Because we're talking about small victories when we do that. Okay? So let's establish our states and not be stateless. Okay? There's only one meaning to that. Okay? Can't just be any type of government. Right? So... This is law class number one. Y'all tune in for the following classes to come every Sunday at five. Again, I'll send you a link if you just um, contact me um, on the information that was shown at the beginning of this presentation. And I'll see everybody soon. Peace.